I find the subject of international cannabis endlessly fascinating, and I spend a good portion of my time on the channel highlighting activities from around the world when it comes to international cannabis. Today I'm going to focus on ICBC, or the International Cannabis Business Conference that took place recently in Berlin, and I'm going to hear from two South Africans that actually attended, Trenton Birch from Sheba Africa, as well as Dr. Shiksha Gallo, who's involved in clinical assessments on the therapeutic benefits of cannabis locally. Their insights are useful, exciting, and it's great to see exactly what is happening in the international landscape. In addition, if you stay till the end, I'll tell you how exactly to get access to these conference proceedings so you can learn, along with the rest of us, about international cannabis. It's an awesome to have you on for discussion. We want to highlight, obviously, the big uh, developments in Germany with all the expos. Specifically, Mary Jane uh, happened, as well as ICBC, um, which is a big event where a lot of delegates from around the world in international cannabis really come together. Uh, can you give us, let's start with ICBC, because uh, that's usually, uh, especially the Berlin version, because they've had ones in Spain before and in Zurich, yeah. but uh, Berlin's always a big one. Uh, what were some of the big takeaways you got from the expo? Because you had a panel as well on global emerging markets uh, in cannabis. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the panel went amazingly well. And uh, I mean, it was actually one of the most uh, well-attended panels across the, the whole conference, which was fantastic. Because obviously, uh, an interest in uh, emerging markets. Um, you know, we had somebody from Uruguay. We had someone from Thailand. Um, we had someone from Australia and New Zealand. It's funny because I often don't think of uh, those kind of countries as emerging markets because they're not developing economies, but they are cannabis emerging markets. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the Mexican uh, guy couldn't make it because he was sick. But it was really interesting to get different perspectives from different territories in terms of what they're looking for, what they're, what they're trying to do. I mean, you know, you've got Uruguay, who are one of the first countries, uh, I think it was, was it 2007 or 2013, I can't remember, but they've uh, been at it for quite a while. So they've uh, got quite, quite, kind of got a lot of experience behind them. And then you had the Thai guy, you know, uh, from Thailand, who basically, you know, as you know, they've just given out a million plants. So these different contrasting environments, as well as Australia and New Zealand, which are very stable countries and economies, which are moving rapidly as well. So those differing opinions were, were really, really interesting. And the, the panel was very well received. Um, and I certainly learned a lot about those, those economies and those emerging markets. But uh, there was certainly an interest in um, markets outside of Europe. Uh, and certainly from a, a perspective of South Africa, we, we, we had a lot of interest in terms of conversations around that space. Yeah, and how did the, let's say, if we use South Africa as a benchmark there, how does the global, a global community look uh, to South Africa in terms of, do they see it as like that, that agri space, you know, that massive cultivator, or do they see it slightly differently, or do they look for partnerships? What was the view in terms of the South African perspective from Europe? Yeah, I mean, Jeff, I was actually quite pleasantly surprised at the openness um, by the people that we met uh, when they heard we were from South Africa. You know, people were always like, oh, you're from South Africa. There, there was always an interest, um, which, uh, which, we, which we should have, you know, because we, we have been, our head has been above the pulpit for, for some time, you know, or for, for decades, actually, um, but on a more formal basis uh, for some time. So the general consensus was there was interest, you know, it wasn't a hard sell, you know, when, when we were talking about offtake agreements, we were talking about connecting people into farms, there was a genuine interest in, uh, in the territory. I mean, what it does ultimately come down to is cost. You know, uh, I think there's a, there's a degree of, you know, we have, we have an exotic flavor, South Africa. There's an interest, especially with the Germans who have very, very strong ties to South Africa. There was a, a genuine interest in, you know, capacitating and engaging. And, but, 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 you know, but, but when, when you strip away the, the sort of sexy stuff, you know, it comes down to cost per gram, you know, as it does everywhere. And it just uh, reinforced and reminded me of how urgent it is to get this industry online, because if we can establish those pipelines and those, those, uh, those connections now, uh, it puts us in very good stead long term, because obviously, as countries like Thailand come online, um, they can compete at the same level. Um, the difference with them and us is they don't have any legacy or any history in cannabis. So they've got a, a lot of learning to do. So we have a strategic advantage. We've just got to capitalize on it. But in, in, all, in, in, in all, I was pleasantly surprised at how warm and open people were. And essentially, you know, because this is still a sunrise industry globally, everybody's there to do business. Everyone's there to exchange details. Everyone's there trying to do a deal. So it was a very open environment and, and very inspiring. No, awesome. And I'll contrast maybe because, I mean, ICBC is always one where, uh, 
you know, it's with business of cannabis, the license side, the medical side, um, the recreational side, surely also business. So I'm going to come back around and ask you about the different uh, subject matter experts talking about, you know, the route to uh, recreational responsible adult use cannabis, uh, you know, in some ways working around the UN conventions, because uh, there's certainly going to have to be some smart lawyers in the room discussing how that's happening. But you were also at Mary Jane, where you did a panel on, you know, obviously the, the rise of the South African cannabis industry. How did the audience and crowd, I suppose, that Mary Jane contrast with ICBC? Because I know Mary Jane's more like a Spanibus type of feel. Yeah, it was a lot of weed smoked at Mary Jane, that's for sure. It's <laughs> a completely contrasting event. I mean, ICBC is B2B, uh, whereas Mary Jane is, is, is B2C with a business element. Uh, so a completely different kettle of fish. I mean, you know, the uh, the Mary Jane event was completely rammed on the weekend. You know, you couldn't move down the corridors. But what was really interesting, Jeff, which I found fascinating, the minute I arrived at Mary Jane, I just saw weed everywhere, you know, bags of it, you know, big bags of it, uh, hash everywhere. Um, and, and, and I was quite blown away by this. And, and then I realized very quickly that everything there was CBD. So there's this insane CBD market for smokables, um, hash, CBD hash, um, you know, resin. I mean, just it completely blew my mind. And and and, and what, so and what they do with this is they, you know, you obviously don't have the the, the the cultivars don't for for CBD don't span across the same uh, uh, genetic profiles as um, as recreational or adult use. Um, but what they've done is they've they've you, you know you can buy all kinds of recreational strains, but they're CBD. And what they do is they take the CBD and they wash it to basically decrease the trichome count, essentially to bring the THC level down. And if they do a test after they've washed it and it's not low enough, they wash it again. So in the beginning, I was quite confused as to why this industry was so big and why it was happening. And then to be frank, I realized, and, and, and after getting feedback from certain people, it's a bit of a fad. You know, it's, yeah. uh, it's basically the Germans being very clever about going right. How can we make sure that we get our pre-roll market sorted out, we get our packaging sorted out, we get our distribution, our pipeline sorted out with CBD, but ultimately to bring on recreational, there's no doubt about it. Because, you know, I had the conversations with people at Mary Jane, you know, about CBD flower and, and why it was so big. And of course, the, the standard answer is because it's medicinal and it's good for this and good for that. And, you know, I'd also ask a few of them, well, you do realize that when you're combusting the CBD that a lot of the medicinal values evaporate and they, they wouldn't be able to answer me because obviously they're trying to sell to the consumers and not used to those kind of questions. But it completely blew my mind because it was, it was so meticulously done. The packaging was really amazing. I mean, this is, uh, the, the, these are, so this is just an example of a packet of, um, uh, the, these are uh, 10 organic Delta smokes, you know? So again, there's a sort of um, no, no THC in this, but CBD, 100% um, lab tested, well packaged. I mean, this, I'll just, I'll take one out because it's quite interesting to see how they package them. They're packaged like proper cigarettes, but it's kind of like a brown color, smells quite, quite sweet. Um, you know, kind of quite progressive packaging. Uh, I mean, it's uh, all kinds of stuff that I got from there. I have to unpack all the paraphernalia. <laughs> I'll see if I can find any more. Um, I didn't bring it back any CBD flour because, you know, I came through Amman and you certainly don't want to be carrying any of that yeah. stuff there. But, you know, even, even bigger boxes like this. So this is, two, this is a 2,000 milligram packet of CBD smokes. Um, but three rolls and, and cones are really big, so um, uh, just a huge, huge market, and also being exposed to the the technology, you know, from trimming machines to to uh, the, the packaging, and it was completely eye opening, but very, very contrasting events, and really good to be able to experience both different types of events. No, awesome, and I like that idea. I mean, that notion of building the supply chain is is something we talk a lot about a lot. Uh, that's often engaged on is how to get the supply chain built specifically for hemp. But it's great to see that focus on the packaging, focus on the pre-rolls, focus on that quality to the consumer, because that's what's going to ultimately count in terms of this global expansion. And if Germany is going to go adult use by, let's say, start of 2024, this is exactly yeah. what they're building in anticipation for that market, because you just change the active that goes in there, uh, which is yeah. something we should definitely encourage, I think, locally in South Africa as well, is have a look at maybe how do we... You know, either we take an extreme like Thailand and just go for it, uh, which I think has got merit, uh, maybe with some kind of controls, uh, a little more standards on the testing. But outside of that, yeah. I mean, it's good to see what Germany is doing in terms of just 
trying to build the infrastructure because that isn't built overnight the marketing the packaging the distribution chain Com completely so you know it's a very strategic move you know and done extremely well so essentially once recreational comes in it just pivots i think to some degree we're we, we're in a position with the cannabis clubs here where we're doing the same. You know, you are seeing pre-rolls in the clubs. You are seeing certain standards and branding and people creating these brands that obviously can't go commercial because they sit within the nonprofit model, but, you know, are lined up for to flip as soon as the recreational model comes online, whenever that might be. Um, but it is important. I mean, what, one of the things I noticed is, um, I, you know, I sat with a few, a few specifically German guys who are like super, super technical. You know, they can look at a bud and they can tell you from 10 feet away what it is. And they, 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 they're, they're scientists, you know. When the Germans do things, they do things properly. So it was very encouraging to see how they've advanced their industry. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, just, just the, the volume of people that are interested in the space is just going from strength to strength. No, absolutely. And uh, I mean, maybe in closing, uh, you know, where do you see South Africa really partnering up? I mean, I'm sure you made some great contacts. Uh, you know, it's always amazing to be at these international uh, events. You get to to meet just a plethora of uh, experts in different areas. Where do you see the partnerships developing going forward between South Africa? And let's just use Germany, but let's use Western Europe yeah. maybe as an example. So, so Germany is definitely open for business with South Africa. You know, all the Germans I met were super keen to engage, to, to understand our market more. Um, you know, they reckon that they need uh, uh, you know, tons of medical cannabis. And they said that the whole of Europe can't really supply what Germany needs alone. You know, there are 85 million people in Germany, a big aging population, a lot of use of uh, pharmaceuticals. So, you know, and they're an intelligent, educated market. So as soon as it starts to move, I, th I think the last I heard there, they've got over 200,000 medical patients and, you know, growing uh, ex exponentially. So they need, they need a supply. Um, but on the flip side, they also need a consistent supply. So what's, what's super important to any South Africans in the industry watching this is we have to get our proverbial you know, together. Uh, we cannot be sending product out of the country that is not up to scratch because well, I did have conversations with, with, with one or two or two people who were a bit skeptical. They'd heard a few stories about product coming out of South Africa that wasn't up to scratch. So we have to be patient. We have to be meticulous, especially with the medical market. And we have to make sure that we get product out that is, uh, you know, that is consistent um, because otherwise we'll just lose the game. The other thing that was very, very interesting, actually, which I must commend uh, our fellow South Africans was there was a real community and bond between the South Africans over there. And we really united. We rolled together. We introduced each other to people. We were at the, the, you know, the, the South African consulate meeting the, 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 the South African German ambassador. Um, so there was really a, a, a sense of this force as a team. We rolled as a pack a lot. Um, and I think that's one thing that was super, super encouraging for me. It wasn't about everybody in it for themselves. Uh, the people who were there really understood that, you know, as I always say, the rising tide lifts all boats. And I really felt like that was an attitude that came across to the South Africans. I want to commend the South Africans for, for being there. And, and then we need to take that attitude and bring it back into our industry here, you know. No, absolutely. And I've seen this in other events as well. Like whenever the South Africans come together at global industry events or whichever event it is, they really stand out in terms of just, you know, that that presence that I think South Africans really bring to these discussions, especially when it's collaborative. Uh, they really stand out in the crowd. It's not just you know, once they realize it's not an Australian or New Zealand accent, they're like, oh, wow. And they can usually pick yeah. it up because uh, just how yeah. South Africans are dressed, the way they're the very direct open friendly warm uh, ask lots of questions you know so i think people internationally enjoy that and i think uh, definitely germany's on the list of uh, your main considerations ideally we get past this point of just strictly medical because medical is gonna i mean they're yeah. off takers i know that won't even touch the first harvest they'll only look at your second or third harvest with stability so with the responsible adult use maybe we see some you know more ex leniency and also because of the demand They've got to bring in cannabis a lot yeah. quicker. And we've got some pretty good standards at these facilities. Uh, so thanks, Trent. And I appreciate you being on. This has been uh, really encouraging cool. to see how South Africa has been represented in Germany at the ICBC. And uh, fantastically all making the time. And for anyone who's interested in cannabis education, consultancy, all the rest, be sure to head over to Shiba Africa. Uh, there's a, invaluable resources that are hosted on not only the YouTube channel, but on the website. And uh, if you haven't been for their training, I'd highly recommend it as well. Uh, I've, I've lectured there. I know other subject matter experts who lecture there. And it's fantastic to just see the knowledge that's openly shared 
with the public in, in the overall sense that we're trying to raise the standard in South African cannabis so that we're taken seriously at this level where we already have such a high quality of cultivation in the country. The rest of the world just needs to appreciate what South Africa is doing. Thanks again, Trenton. Completely. Cool. Thanks so much, Jeff. Take Thanks. care. Bye. Hi, Dr. Gallo. It's great to have you on today uh, to discuss the, the recent trip you had to ICBC in Berlin. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, it's the International Business uh, Cannabis Conference where a lot of activity has come together from multiple delegates around the world. Um, and I'd like to find out in terms of the event, uh, you know, what were some of the biggest takeaways you took from attending? Awesome. Thanks, Jeff, for having me. Uh, it, you know, it's actually been amazing. It was a great opportunity you know, to be part of an international conference. Uh, Germany was actually huge uh, with regards to what they're doing. So it was very business orientated. I mean, compared to the other conferences like the Mary Jane, a um, lot of networking happened. Uh, the talks were, were good, uh, some of them. Uh, so, so, so the takeaways for me is, um, you know, Germany is going to be one of the biggest markets. Everybody wants to get into it. And from the medicinal side, um, you know, they're making progress. But what I've spoken to some of the medical professionals, they are uh, people involved in the medical space is what they feel is they are not getting it out there to the doctors to prescribe. And they need to implement a stronger strategy because you can have medical cannabis access, but you need the doctors to actually prescribe it. The, what they mentioned in many of the, um, you know, sessions that we sat in is that the patients know more than the doctors. Mm. Uh, so the doctors are still hesitant to actually prescribe but same that's happening here in South Africa and globally. Uh, with regards to recreational, you know, um, as you're aware, you know, Germany wants to open up the recreational markets. Uh, so that's something that was really exciting. But then again, you know, the census is my opinion, please. Uh, this is what I took back or what I felt. I felt they still don't know where they're going. You know, they have all these regulations. They, they have an idea of what they're going to do. But people are, are talking in a disconnected way. You know, some people are mentioning something crazy that I've heard uh, in one of the discussions. And when I spoke to somebody there, is that they feel that they should have EU GMP uh, regulations for recreational. Um, now, for me, I'm like, then you're restricting half of the world to come into. And you need a large amount quantity of cannabis and you now going to put these highly regulated standards for recreational, it didn't make sense. So the takeaways for me was that uh, there's a disconnect. Um, why regulate recreational according to EU GMP that leaves us out, you know, leaves Africa out, it leaves uh, a lot of other countries out. Uh, what is the justification for trying to do that? It's just talk right now. Um, the, the getting access to patients as well is, is the other thing. But with regards to business, I think it was really great. The, the networking was great. Uh, the people that we met all, from all over the world, uh, it was really great. And I think Germany wants to stand out and be that, uh, you know, to set things apart from what's happened in Canada and, you know, really go big. So, yeah, that was just my opinion there. No, awesome. I mean, it's interesting because they're, they're having these expert committees coming together to give inputs on the framework. I mean, hopefully we see that they don't go the way that uh, we've seen with Malta and we've seen with Luxembourg, where it's just like, okay, we don't want to tackle the issue of uh, responsible adult use recreational cannabis. So we allow people to grow at home. It doesn't really open commercial trade. But if they do mm -hmm. open commercial trade, they are in the violation of the UN convention. So hopefully they can put a very structured um, proposal forward to the United Nations that's in alignment with, you know, how it is. In, in the reality of the world right now you know it's it's one where thailand's doing what they want to do so you can't just mm -hmm. keep uh, saying you know something from the 1960s or the 70s dictates the rest of our futures um and hopefully they'll open up this commercial network and like you said uh, hopefully should have standards uh unlike maybe what's happening in thailand at the moment but it should mm -hmm. not be ridiculous standards where it's like the highest oh. level of medicinal products because you're not really a patient when it's responsible adult use you are a consumer, exactly. so it should be more consumer aligned. Mm -hmm. And in terms of how the delegates, because there were a few South Africans that were over, how did some of the delegates uh, see the South Africans? You know, was it a little more serious? Were they, were they treating South Africa a little more seriously than maybe they would have a few years ago in terms of like, ah, now it's more of like recognizing <laughs> the potential from the region? Look, I want to be very honest that I'm not biased because I'm South African. South Africans, we rocked it there. We were the most awesome crowd. <laughs> Because, you know, everybody can just come and talk to us about anything. So, you know, and seeing all the other South Africans made it really great for us. 
you know, we have a different, you know, we, we have a different culture when it comes to cannabis. You know, I honestly feel South Africa should be the global leaders in cannabis because I'm not trying to uh, say this in a derogatory way to any country at all, what I'm about to say, but I honestly feel that South Africans, we are really, really uh, knowledgeable when it comes to cannabis. If I listen to, you know, the panel discussions and, you know, Trenton was the moderator in one of them and, you know, he came across confident. He knew what he was talking about. If you just compare to some of the other discussions, South Africa should should be the hub you know we, our our um, knowledge as i mentioned with the education with the cannabis itself we also I asked some questions there i didn't get an answer that you would actually expect to to get you know because uh, what i found is a lot of the delegates did not actually have a lot of knowledge about cannabis and you expect that to be you expect people you know to have a lot of knowledge and i'm not um, just saying this because i'm south african but i feel the south africans knowledge has been really widespread and i think it's because we've been dealing with cannabis for years you know we understand it from a uh, indigenous knowledge systems. We understand it from a medicinal system. We understand it from a hemp system. We've been busy with hemp research for the past 20 years, uh, you know, with the hemp research that was approved. We understand every different aspect of the plants. Uh, I also sit on the Cannabis Clinician Society, uh, Jeff, as you're aware, in the UK and the US. And, you know, the knowledge that we share and what they gain from South Africa and what we've learned by just doing little anecdotal evidence, be it on patients or even on hemp research, I mean, there's so much that we can add. And what was exciting about this conference, it was evident there. It was evident and everybody said, hey, you South Africans, you actually know your cannabis, you know? And I remember, I think it was Ayanda or Trent who says, yeah, because we come from cannabis. We, you know, this is what we what we we know for centuries. We, we, we've been growing, we have the like what third, I think third largest illegal uh, cannabis grown in, in the world. So there was a lot of positive from there. And South Africa definitely has its space and it was shown uh, in the cannabis, in the business space, and in every single facet. No, awesome, excellent. I, I fully agree with that. I mean, I've seen this not just in cannabis, I've seen this in other fields, you know, whether it's uh, medical fields, medical conferences, pharmaceutical, like even when uh, I remember going to Ireland uh, for a pharmaceutical event, and it was like, they were really very, very surprised by the extent to which, like, South Africans actually really have a very good global understanding. And I think it's partly because uh, we grow up looking to the Northern Hemisphere for information, for knowledge, and we don't become very stuck in our ways in terms of like a, a lot of people, I won't be derogatory either, either, but in the <laughs> States, you know, there's no need to actually travel outside the States often because there's so much first variety between the different States that, you know, it becomes very, uh, you know, very centric. Uh, whereas I think we look around at Australia, New Zealand, Colombia, Israel, Malta, we just look wherever there is activity and we look to understand those markets. And I think that makes the South African representation very strong in terms of understanding, you know, the dynamics and also growing up around the plant, you know, it's ever present in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and like you said, uh, Interpol has put us on the list as one of the largest <laughs> illicit uh, cultivators. So no, it's fantastic to see that. And now I'd like to maybe wrap up with a final question around an area where I know you've been active in the clinical side, you know, it's very difficult because there's that whole clinical comparison versus real world evidence that drug uh, science often pushes with Professor Nutz, you know, like where in terms of the um, the clinical side, was there a lot of discussion on, uh, you know, because I mean, the FDA approval of Epidiolex was a big win for cannabis to, to be taken more seriously as a medication. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of phase threes that are starting to crop up. But was there a strong presence of like, you know, there's going to be more clinical indications coming through the pipeline and more drugs could see marketing authorizations uh, in different jurisdictions? No, uh, thanks for that question. Actually, you know, I had people stalking me and trying to find me when they found out I was there. Uh, the reason is in the US and the UK and Germany as well, they were unable to get this opioid study that I got approved to get it approved uh, to run any clinical research on it. And you know, the US has a huge opioid crisis. So there's a lot of Americans that came to speak to me, a lot of people in Germany that are really, really keen. And I met, uh, I've networked with amazing people that want to be involved in the research in South Africa. They're excited, they're waiting for the results because they feel that if that is something that is needed. Because remember, I also have a very large sample size. We're looking at a thousand. Uh, patients, and we're obviously using the South African population because we got only approval for South Africa um, with pharma ethics. So um, it's going to be a you know real world evidence as well. So uh, the entire globe is really waiting, and they were really excited. And I had a lot of people that were really excited that we've got approval for the study, and they want to be a part of it, see the results because it will impact on Germany, it'll impact on the US, it'll impact on the entire world because what we're doing is 
then once we have this evidence, they will you be able to use this data to motivate for themselves to say, look, we need a pain management replacement from the opioids. We see the deaths, we see the overdose, we see the tolerance. It's not even giving patients that pain relief uh, after a certain period of time because of the tolerance, whereas cannabis can or cannot. Um, the pilot study as well, we have great results. We had almost 98% of the patients that uh, showed a positive result with regards to the pain management and we are able to wean them off Jeff, the issue that we've been having, and I had a discussion with a lot of people there at RCBC, is cannabis is not like a morphine where you can give them a specific uh, you know, prescription or a dose. Uh, what we noticed and the other doctors as well we've been chatting it's it's it's, it's patient specific you know the the, yeah. the dose is patient specific so you may tolerate a five milligram thc somebody else may tolerate a 10 or 20 so we microdose but it depends on what so that is the iffiness that we're trying to work around because it's uh, the endocannabinoid system and how you know it functions is every person it's an individualized treatment plan so that is why most of the um, studies never got approved you know they couldn't put in to say look this is how this is the exact dose we're giving the patient because we we don't know you know you can estimate and that's how you're gonna you know microdose it up so that was um that was really promising i've made really good contacts with international people that are going to actually be assisting us and part of the study in south africa so for me, that was the, actually one of the highlights um, is, you know, having this global connection where everybody benefits from the results of the South African based study, which is the only study that's actually approved now with such a large scale um, participant number. Awesome. Oh, well, I'm excited to see that uh, study start to reach the stages of, you know, conclusion. I know it's going to be a continuous process. There's going to be quite a bit going into the assessment. But like you said, science is universal, which means um, wherever there's clinical studies, wherever there's presence, wherever there's even real world studies, the more data that's collected, the more open governments are to the recognition of the medical use. And like you said, it's difficult to titrate the patient into the correct dose. But, you know, hopefully also with next generation sequencing, as we get sequencing data, mm -hmm. as we get all sorts of data to tie into this, we understand the pharmacology a lot better. And uh, with that, you know, adverse reporting, counterindications, all of this will start to become more pervasive in terms of our knowledge. And, uh, and I hope and I anticipate to see South Africa lead a dominant role in this space mm -hmm. because it's great to see just the work and the knowledge base that's been built up in the country. And thank you, Dr. Gallo, for coming on and sharing your you. insights from ICBC. And uh, hopefully I'll be joining you guys next year when uh, it happens again. And it's a super exciting thing to see so many South Africans that went through uh, to Germany this year. No, awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. It was amazing. And definitely will be, will be with us next year for sure. Cool. <laughs> much Excellent. more South Africans. Thanks a lot. <laughs> bye -bye. Cheers. Bye. bye. Now, I hope you enjoyed hearing from Dr. Gallo as well as Trenton about ICBC Berlin and the insights they've taken from it. Well, if you wanted to know what actually happened at the conference, good news is that the conference proceedings are actually live on YouTube. ICBC is one of those organizations that makes the added effort of recording the content and putting it out publicly to the broader audience. So I'm going to link them up in the comments. Be sure to go have a look at the footage. It's absolutely amazing and great subject matter experts speaking.